exercise, uh, and each one of the things that they do in the way of something physical is to demonstrate what goes on in the inner, in the heart, in the spiritual. And so the, the rigors of exercise are merely exemplary or demonstrative of something in the way of the rigors of spiritual life and the battles that are before us and that confront us. So you can become very tired, weary, worn out, but you keep pressing on. And so uh, they mix their uh, metaphors in the physical and in the spiritual, and they allow the kids to see it, breathe it, feel it, and then uh, experience something in their life. And it's neat when you have uh, not just one half hour service or an hour service or an hour and a half service, or for Leah say, two hour services, just for Leah's sake. Um, but you have an entire week, an entire week, uh, five days of uh, concentrated prayer, praise, challenges, and the word. So uh, those are wonderful times, all of which we've all experienced one time or another and would love to experience again, even though sometimes our older bodies can't take it. So Maddie, why don't you come first, and that way Gabriel can get, uh, make sure he gets you on the camera for the world to see. <laughs> so he kind of explained like the gist of boot camp. Um, I'm going to talk about day two for us, which was well, first of all, each day has a theme. Day one was um, the day of consecration. And we went around and we prayed for the camp. We prayed over it, just kind of getting the week started with prayer. It was really cool. Day two, which is the day I'm going to talk about, is the day of conquest. Day three was oh, covenant. Covenant. Thank you. <laughs> covenant. Day four was captivity, and day five was commissioning. So on day two, the whole um, theme of the day was the day of conquest, and they wanted us to conquer things. So we started out in the morning, getting up super early, the sun wasn't even up that day, and we get up and we're getting ready to go to um, PT, and so we get there and they tell us, you're going to do this as a platoon, you're going to do it all together, and you have to conquer it together as a platoon, and so um, we, had the, um, we had a captain, our captain, Luke Williams, was, he came to us and he was like, okay, as a platoon, you have to do 500 push-ups. You have to break it up, however many each person can do, and then put it together and it has to be 500. And we did that for a while. He would give us different numbers. I think we ended up doing like 600 burpees. <laughs> we would, he would give us, he'd say, okay, do 100. We'd do 100 and we'd get done and said, okay, do 100 more. And so it went on like that for a long time. And so when we were done, we, every morning we would march in and we'd do our cadence and we'd have our flag and everything. Then we would go eat. And so we get in there and the food is colored. Oh. We had green eggs and ham, which we thought was really interesting. They said, you have to conquer your fear of eating things that don't look right. And we were like, all right. So it went on like, it was like that all day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Everything was colored. It was green and blue and just really weird. And they had like spiders in the salad, like little plastic ones. It was really interesting. <laughs> so that day in session, we, do, we did about six hours of session every day. We'd break it up. We'd do like hour and a half and then we'd go do activities and we'd do two more hours and then have lunch and we had nap and then do several more hours in the evening. And so that day we were talking about the book of Joshua and talking about how he had to, you know, take Israel and take all the people that had come out of Israel and lead them. And then they went and they conquer, conquered the walls of Jericho. And we talked about that. And it was really, really cool. And um, one of the activities that we did was we called it the, the fear gauntlet. And it was where you would have six or seven leaders and they would stand in two lines and one person would walk up, and they, were, they would say, okay, what do you want to overcome? Mm -hmm. And you would tell them, and then you had to physically fight through them wow. to get to the end. Wow. And it was like a physical representation of fighting through those fears. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the biggest ones for me was uh, the fear of letting people down or um, not living up to their expectations. 
throughout this whole track season and going to state yeah. and getting yeah. there, and it was such a big deal. Me, for me personally, I felt that if I didn't win it all, then I was going to disappoint people, and I wasn't going to live up to what they were expecting me to be. Yeah. And it really, it humbled me in a way of saying, you made it there, and that's huge, yeah. but you have to give all the glory to God because Amen. he let you get there. Right. And so um, that was the biggest one that I felt mm -hmm. personally. And there were people crying going through them. It just hit people so hard, that physical representation of fighting through those fears or mm -hmm. the struggle. And it was, that was really cool. But So we went back into session that afternoon, and then... For the bigger activity that um, evening, we had all the platoon together, and there were six different stations. And we had to go to each, sta each station, and they were all around the camp in a big circle, and do different act and do different activities. The first one we went to, I don't know if it was the first one. I'll probably say these all out of order, but we went to one where um, they put on a skit, and then we had to find an encouraging Bible verse in like 30 seconds mm -hmm. and then give it to them that one was that one was harder because you know sometimes you can't really you're looking for something and you can't find it as quickly and then people are spewing out verses and you're like oh okay i gotta find one now mm -hmm. so it was just kind of um, being ready to uh when someone is feeling down or mm -hmm. um just discouraged to encourage them and give them life through the word mm -hmm. and another one was we had to go there were leaders standing in like a kind of a semicircle. And we had to go up to one of them in, um, in pairs and um, share the gospel with them. And it was really, it was, that was difficult because um, I'm not good at talking in front of people. And so for me, I talk a lot. And so sometimes I, I would just stand there and I'd just keep talking and I wouldn't stop. And then they would be like, all right, can, can I get something in? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course you can. Yeah, talk. <laughs> and so, and they would um, immediately, they'd start giving you false false things and just tearing you down, saying, no, why, why is this, why is this? One of them asked what the Trinity was, and we, they were like, How, what, is, what even is that? And they were like, um, well, and you just kind of have to explain things to them and ask them questions, and they're just tearing you down and tearing you down. But that was a really good exercise for some people that weren't used to sharing the gospel with people. And another station was we had to go into this big room, and there were little pieces of paper that had some had Bible verses on them, and some had these sayings that kind of sounded like Bible verses, but they weren't, or they were just sayings by these philosophers or whatever. And we had to go and we had to pick out the false ones. And so that was really hard. We and when and all the ones that we didn't get, or the ones that we picked up that were Bible verses, we had to do um, PT for it. <laughs> so, it was like, okay, that was really difficult though. And we only had, I think we had like five minutes to do it all. And it was this huge room with lots of tables, lots of them on there. And you're going through and you see one that says stuff like about sin. And you're like, well, I think that's a Bible verse, but I'm not really sure. So you pick it up anyway. And then you're like, yeah, that was a Bible verse. Yeah. So that was really, that was difficult. Um... I'm trying to think of all the ones that we went to. But the gist of that was um, just conquering all of those, um, the things that are thrown at you. Oh, and the last one was, this was a big one. We all sat down, and um, there was a, one of our leaders there had, was at seminary, had been at seminary in Texas. And so they had asked him to preach to us, but he was preaching a false doctrine. He told us to open our Bibles, and he was talking about how Mary was not a virgin. How she, he was like giving all these, the Greek definition of things, and telling us how she wasn't really a virgin. She was just a young woman. And we had to come back and explain to him why he was wrong, and give him verses, and back, back each other up on this. That was difficult, because it was kind of... When, when we would go to each station, they'd kind of brief us on what we were doing. And when we got to that one, our major told us, she was like, all I can tell you is put up your spirits of discernment. And then as soon as he started talking, we all kind of figured it out. And we were like, wait, that's not right. And so then we had to kind of set him straight and back each other up with different verses. And that whole thing was really, really cool. It was different. And so I think that made it 
kind of just bonding us all together and um, just bringing us together as a platoon and doing doing things together. So that whole day was really, really cool of just conquering things and going through things together as a team. And that night, every night we had um, community time, which was we would all go to this big lodge where we ate and had session, and they would just play worship music, and we could go around, we could pray with each other and talk to each other if we needed to talk to a leader. We could just do that. We could walk outside or just sit and have quiet time. And I was walking around, and I was praying, and, you know, God really hit me with the whole track thing and feeling like I wasn't good enough and everything, and um, a song came on. It was one that I had heard a long, a long time ago, and I liked it, and it was um, Hope in Front of Me by Danny Gokey. And uh, the lyrics go, there is hope in front of me, there is a light that I can still see, there is a hand still holding me even when, I can't, even when I don't believe. And that hit me so hard, and I just like started crying, and I, just, I didn't really know what to do with myself, because I'm sitting and I'm crying to this song, and I'm just like, oh my goodness, all of this is hitting me at one time. And it was just so cool the way God moves. Amen. And yeah, that was my... Um, that was my favorite day, and a lot of people said that there was no day that could beat that, and it was just so amazing how all of it came together, and so many people were broken that day, and just having all of this, God speaking to them of conquering things and going and facing their fears, and it was just, it was awesome. <laughs> Maddie, you want to explain a little bit of how boot camp works, how it is very much like a military boot yeah. camp. You want to explain basically yeah. how the platoon, yeah, how so each rank We're each works. in platoons, just like a military would be. We have six different platoons, and Gabe was a private because he was his first year, and this is my second year, so I'm a corporal. Third year. <laughs> Third years are sergeants, and fourth years are staff sergeants. And then on the rank of leaders, the first years are lieutenants, and then it goes captain, major, and colonel. We only have one major and one colonel in each platoon, and there's several captains and several lieutenants. And then we have Buck Sutton, who is pretty much like the leader of TFC. He's the general. We only have one general. And every day we would march in, you know, we do a marching, we say our cadence, we get there, and we have to do like the platoon, attention, and then like we have to salute, and then he'll say at ease, order arms, all of that, very, very military. And that, and we couldn't call people by their first names, we had to call them by their rank and their last name. And if we didn't know their last name, we could just call them by their rank, or if we didn't know their rank, we could call them by their last name. So, and if we called people by their first name, we had to do push-ups. <laughs> so everything was um, not really punishment, but just kind of learning. Yeah. Um, like if we did something wrong, we would get punished for it, but it wasn't the sense of you're doing something wrong, you're getting like, it was just, yeah, it was just different. And it's very, very military based, very physically demanding. But they do, they tie in the physical demandment with the, whatever we're learning that day. So the one day we were learning about, um, it was the day of covenant. And we had to follow all these laws. And they were crazy laws. They were like, if a leader came up to you and said, I love you or encourage you, you had to immediately give them a Bible verse. And it had, it, it mean, it had to be a good Bible verse. It couldn't just be like, Jesus wept. Like, it, that, that wasn't acceptable. And, uh, and even after a while, when people were giving them John 3.16, they're like, no, give me another one. And then I had written, so I was smart, and I wrote a couple, wrote a couple um, references on my hand. So I'd look at it and then give them to them, and they're like, no, I want one from the New Testament. I don't like the book of John. Give me one from Romans. <laughs> and so then you're like, oh, well, and you're like trying to think, and they're like, yeah, too late. And so then they, they would mark your arm with a red Sharpie, and you had to do PT for every mark that you had. And it was really, really difficult. And another thing was we were playing a soccer game. And one of the rules was we were paired up with someone and they tied our ankles together. And so we played students against leaders. And of course, when the students lost, we had to do PT. <laughs> and so... Yeah, it was just really, every day was different. You never knew what you were, what was coming. You didn't know what to expect. And so 
I love it. I loved it last year. I loved it this year. I can't wait for next year. They're already talking about starting to plan it in August, and I was like, yes, I can't wait to see what's going what's to happen, what's, what God's going to do there, and what the theme is going to be, and it's just, it's so awesome. I love it. It's great. Right. Yeah. 13th in the state's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My goodness, my goodness. Go ahead. Okay. Come up and make sure you get the camera right. Yeah, so no, I know. I have it. She's got my hit points. <laughs> okay, I will try to keep it short and such. But um, as she said, day two was a really good day. It was also my favorite day. Um, I got hit a lot with a lot of things, like the gauntlets. Those were fun. Um, they were a lot harder for the men because they would literally like come with you. It's like amazing. But um, <laughs> that was fun. That was my favorite day by far. And then the uh, rules day was a lot of fun too because I got like literally hundreds of marks. I didn't know. So they made a lot of difficult rules that day, like you can say personal pronouns, so you can talk in I or me, so that's where I know about my things, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's hard to talk in third person. But um, day two was my favorite by far, I think, just I got broken most that day, um, just by a lot of things, just you know, feeling uh, sad for my friends, and just God speaking to me about it. And, talking to people that read the gospel, that are my family and friendships and such. So that hit me really hard. I was like falling crazy. Oh. Like I walked yeah. that day and I was just really emotional. And but um each day like she said had a theme and there's a lot of PT, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry if I'm nervous. But um I enjoyed it a lot for my first year. I mean, I was kind of expecting it because I heard some from Maddie and my platoon, most of my platoon had been there in these two years before, so they were telling us things. So there's a lot to expect. Day four was a really surprising day because it was called uh, captivity. And they were going really easy on you. They didn't do as many things, and they're trying to show you how subtle uh, the devil can be sometimes. So they didn't uh, play videos like they usually did one day or we didn't have uh, as many rules that day, and everything seemed a lot easier. And then like at the end of the day, they hit us with um, all these things that made like a lot of people sad. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and they showing how subtle the devil can be with sin and everything. Like they gave us money, and there was a lot of com uh, competitive stuff mm -hmm. for that day. So like each person, each platoon had to win challenges to make money and such. And then we thought we were going to be able to spend that money maybe to buy something for our platoon, but we ended up having to spend it where we spent most of our money and time in the world mm -hmm. in this big like mm -hmm. big lodge, and uh, that hit a lot of people. Um, and then we went to a smaller lodge place with uh, missionary places and none of us had money left and that made a lot of people cry and stuff because we just spend a lot of time in the world and so that day hit me pretty hard and I was like well, I didn't notice how much like time I had spent in certain places and I didn't get my priorities set but um, I really enjoyed boot camp as a first year person it was a lot of fun the first day was cool it was like boys and uh, girls day so the boys did really cool fun stuff um, I don't know I just enjoyed it as a whole um, Sorry if I, I don't talk as much right <laughs> Sometimes I can speak fine and other times I can't. But like this happened at boot camp, I was like sitting there and it had to be a nighttime thing. And I didn't want to talk, of course. The box's like, oh, you should go. Like, okay. so, <laughs> so sometimes I'm good, other times I'm not. And if I speak back, it's forgive me. But um, yeah, I enjoyed it as a well. whole. Um, I had a great platoon, they were the best. They were like, of really organized people, even though it took us like until our last week to get everything ready, we were like, most organized. And they're pretty awesome, and uh, we really support each other well. And even though not all of us like opened up as much after the team time, me included, so uh, we really I grew close as a family and everything. And yes, I mean I enjoyed it, and that's probably about all. <laughs> First Corinthians 15. Yay, I heard somebody say. Um, First Corinthians 15. Let's turn there real quick. I enjoyed that. Didn't you enjoy that? Yeah. That was really precious to hear how God stirs the heart of a young person. If anybody wants to see like, recap videos yeah. of the week, you can go to Teens for Christ's um, Facebook page and like their Facebook page or the Teens for Christ website. They, they'll have all the recap videos from each day. Where pictures you can, too. You, and pictures where you can, the things that they said, you can kind of put everything together. That's neat. You may not have known this, but uh, Becca actually works for Team for Christ. She, so she is now, how many hours a week do you? Oh, about 10. 10 hours a week, so, yeah, so that's neat. 
That's really neat. It's a great, uh, it's a great organization. I had heard of Teens of Christ for years and years and years and had no idea that it actually originated. It started right here in Lima, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And a few uh, folks with uh, vision that could infuse some money into it and then Buck's desire to see it through and his wife. And then it's grown from one chapter to how many now? Oh gosh, there's like 30. 30 chapters seven in, different, in seven different states. And then it's overseas as well. Overseas, yeah. yeah, exactly. Like in Africa. And Africa. Africa. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really awesome, and it'll continue to grow because it's it really um, permeates. It really uh, speaks to the heart of a young person, and that's that's where it begins. And so I just I like the wisdom. Mad, uh, Mandy, you had how many years? I went two years. Yeah, so Mandy went two years, and you weren't you a teacher also, or instructor, or whatever you call it. Two years after I graduated. Yeah, so then she went back, taught for two years after she graduated. So it's been going on for how many years? This was the. 15th year, a boot camp. camp. Um, Teens for Christ. 1996, I think, is when Teens for Christ started. started. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. All right, uh, I want to type just for a moment. Actually, I've got way too many pages, so I'm not going to try to finish this, and that's kind of a relief to me because I, I do have to go to work today. So, <laughs> <laughs> But I'm going to title this Time, the Mighty Current. Mm -hmm. Time the mighty current. And um, I've always asked myself the question, philosophically and even scientifically, time, what is time? I mean, we never really stopped to ask ourselves that question, but what is time? You know, we barely have a grasp on the concept of eternity, but we really don't even understand time. Uh, Einstein didn't understand it, and he had some ideas, and he merged them with relativity, um, can time be slowed down? Can a person live longer if he's further away from gravity? All these different uh, aspects of um, further away from the sun's radiation. Why did man live longer in Noah's day? Why did they live to be uh, uh, 986 years old? Uh, nearly almost a thousand years for prolonged generations. For almost 1,500 years they were living to be to be uh, 600, 700, 800, have their first child when they were 400. Um, <clears throat> and then man slowly becoming, uh, becoming more and more, time becoming more, greater brevity, uh, condensed. Time is more condensed today. Uh, the church all the way to the reception hall in, in I think it was uh, Elida. And I remember in that carriage with uh, Steve, Steve and at that time it would have been Barb, Steve and Barb Marsh, and how slow we went, clippity-clop, clippity-clop, clippity-clop. And I, I, I could just about count all the wild daisies and dandelions along the road. And it was peaceful. And for centuries, for millennia, that's how people traveled. Clippity-clop, clippity-clop, clippity-clop. So they would not get very far. Um, probably had no ulcers. And, uh, and here you had people in the country, in the wilderness, uh, forging out a living with their own hands and an axe and building a log cabin and building a, a rock fireplace. And then maybe it would take a two and a half days or a day to get into what they called a town where you could buy your grub and go to a small little um, market and uh, get a few necessities, and then maybe be there for Sunday service, and then go all the way back and never see town again. There was no, uh, there we go again, there was no Sam's Wholesale, there was no Costco, there was no, you can just unplug that thing, or shoot it, I don't care. Um, there, was, there was no Walmart, no First Church or Walmart, and so there was, there was no real conveniences, and time went by... You say slowly? No, it was, it was the realm they lived in for that time. Now, everything's push button, and what? Guess what? You still don't have time. We cram more into time. A man's become smarter. Uh, he's become uh, more knowledgeable. Sciences, science, the sciences, um, and knowledge is doubling and tripling, quadrupling. Whereas once you could go a thousand years and science would barely advance. 
maybe double. Now there's, they can't even hardly put a number to how fast knowledge is increasing. So we're doing more with time. We're going a lot faster and a lot farther. But time is still, nonetheless, the mighty current. We can't stop it. We can't save it. We can't put it in a bottle and sell it. They try to sell water, and they've done pretty well with it. I remember the day when you have never bought a bottle of water, and now we all buy bottles of water. They even got places in Europe where you can go into rooms and you can be infused with a higher uh, intensity of oxygen to invigorate you. Now they're selling the air. But, but you can't bottle time. Can't sell time. So it's the mighty current. And I want to subtitle this, The Splendor of Aging. The glory, I was thinking of superlatives when I thought about aging. Because I wanted to, give, I wanted to make sure that we understand from God's perspective, time and aging are, is what it's all about. There's no, there's no uh, real practical use for youth if you don't get older. There's no practical use or purpose for youth if you don't get older. So some of the superlatives I want to describe for aging, magnificent, glorious, grandeur, splendid aging. Can you, have you ever said, sisters, splendid age spots, <laughs> splendid wrinkles, uh, majesty, the brilliance and brightness of aging. That's how God sees it, though. God sees aging as brilliance. You go to a nursing home, people are drooling, sitting in a chair, all curled up. They're on their drugs. They're, they're, and you say, no dignity. That's not what God sees. God doesn't see that. God doesn't see a room that reeks of chemicals and urine. God doesn't see that at all. Precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. God sees something purposeful, incredibly important and useful in time. In time. In this current called time. So the glory, the splendor, the majesty, the dignity of aging. Hollywood and all of its ability with... with uh, with being able to, with CGI, with the ability to manipulate and to digitize and to make something Jurassic. <coughs> and yet, they've never had, never got a grip on the beauty and splendor of aging. So, for God, wrinkles and folds and creases are a needful path to su suggestity to being a sage, to, to understanding. Wrinkles mean wisdom. To the gray hair, to the white-headed woman, that is, saged knowledge. Every young person uh, should draw from the wisdom of their parents what they have learned and garnered, and how life has changed them, molded them, time has, and made them more humble, more grateful, more thankful, more respectful. Glorious age. Glorious wrinkles. The older you get, the more unearthly you become. Sure, the body returns to the earth, but the soul is set free. After it's learned what it was supposed to learn in the time capsule, in the body that can age. So, thank God for aging. Thank God for growing and growing up. Thank God for a body that can return to the dust. Thank God for maturing. Thank God, Brother Chris, for my Buckeye card. <laughs> so, 
So think of an aging body. After a while, it's barely aware of its surroundings as they're passing on. Uh, they, they, they don't see much, perceive much of their earthly surroundings. The, the beeping of the machines in the, in the <coughs> hospital room, the, the uh, in and out of consciousness, the pulse is getting weaker, the heart rate is slowing. But what's happening? That person is about to live. About to live. So death, the Bible said, is swallowed up of life. Wow. I thought life was swallowed up by death. No. For the Christian, death is swallowed up by life. So let's understand it. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Everything that the culture teaches us really is, and what we teach ourselves, is really the reverse of how God perceives things. Death is truly life. Death is truly graduation. It's not the finish. It's barely, barely, barely the beginning. So 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, it's the body we're in now, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So, in order to bear the image of the heavenly, we first have to bear the image of the earthy. Now this I say, brethren, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So we are not going to step into eternity in this body. Flesh and blood. Neither can corruption, obviously, inherit incorruption. So that means that the corruptible part of us has to go back to the dust, the earth, back to becoming dirt again. Substance in the table of minerals. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Now, I want to take a different take on that. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. The change, actually, the changing, this is metamorphosis. This is going from a, a slithering caterpillar to a beautiful butterfly. But the change is actually going on right now. As we age, we change. That's what, that's what time is all about. So look at verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. This is metamorpho. We're going to get off the ground as a caterpillar and we're going to become a splendid butterfly. For this corruptible must, I like the word must, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. Now, I want you young people to understand this verse in verse 53. This corruption, that's when a person has died, will put on incorruption. Now, the next verse is, and this mortal, that's when a person is alive. We're living our mortal life now. will put on immortality. So this is telling us that some will be dead and be raised to life. Some will be alive and go from mortal to immortality. So people say, will there be a rapture? Will there be a time when we're literally doing something pre occupied in our life and be changed in the moment of a twinkling of an eye? Well, the Bible tells us that the dead that have been, are in the grave and have become a part of the elements of the earth again, they're going to become incorruptible. But the mortal will put on immortality. The living will then put on immortality. So we're beginning to see barely over the, uh, on page, half of page two that death and time are very needful, very useful, very purposeful. Much, 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 much the plan that God has. So when this corruptible, verse 53 again, for this corruption, corruptible must put on incorruptible. So the, this, the, Bible, is call, the Bible calls the human body corruptible. And it puts on incorruption. But the mortal, the living body, 
is called immortality. Then we step into a body that's immortal. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, Paul is saying there's a saying that's been written. Have you ever found that saying in the Old Testament? I never have. But it's somewhere, either in, in the literal or figurative sense, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. It's written somewhere in the Bible, I don't know how or where, that death is swallowed up in victory. So, so death isn't the victory. Death is swallowed up in victory. So let's watch it now. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? So the sting of death, obviously, is sin. Remember the day you eat thereof. The day you sin, you will die. And the strength of sin is the law, the legal requirements. But thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a verse that would be good to memorize. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Look at that verse. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Therefore, wherefore, why for? Because as you grow older, don't lose, the, don't lose what the meaning of life is all about. The meaning of life is all about change. All right? And the meaning of life is all about, as, as, as Maddie and Jared brought, Gabriel brought out, the meaning of life is all about sharing that change. Platoons. Platoons. You didn't do it individually. You did it as a group. Some were students. Some were teachers. Some were, uh, some were uh, uh, lower in rank. Some were higher in rank. Some were uh, young. Some were aged. It's necessary. It's just, it's, that's why parents come before children. So there's something about the process of aging that, in a sense, nobody's really, really written a good book about. God wrote the book. But the glory, the dignity, the necessity of aging, the glory, the power, the supernatural process of time. So, can you imagine marvel you know, they've made incredible movies about superhuman uh, people. And, but can you imagine them putting out a movie on the supernatural process, the divine reasoning for aging and for time? So we, we, we talk about the three spatial elements or dimensions, you know, depth and, and, and width and height. You know, we, we, we were, we, those are measurements. Everything in this room is a measurement. Everything here is, in a, is a mathematical equation. It can be taken down to the smallest, smallest unit. But time is also a unit. Time is also a measurement. Time is a creation. Time's a creation for the purpose of measuring. So, if Marvel could put out a movie on the supernatural, the genius, the wisdom behind aging, behind time. Now, when you think of aging as a young person, you think of wrinkles and the, the need for more foundation. But that's not how God looks at aging whatsoever. At all. See, for God... Hollywood, it's all about um, brighter teeth and tummy tucks. It's all, it's, it's all about cosmetic surgery and facelifts in order to remain an actor, to in order to remain gainfully employed, you have to look young. So all, old, all young actors become old. What roles generally do they play 
when they get older. They play the role of the sage, the wise man, the learned individual, the father. Um, Thor had a father. He was a wise, aged old man. Uh, Spider-Man had a, an uncle told him how that with, with strength and power comes great responsibility. There was that person at one time, that actor at one time, played youthful roles. But now he's the wise sage. So even Hollywood understands that there's a transfer. That youth is supposed to metamorphosis, transform into wisdom. Youth is to transform into sage knowledge. Youth is to transform into experiences that you will take into eternity. So for Hollywood and for the culture, it's, it's Botox. But for God, it's not really cosmetic surgery, it's cosmos surgery. Cosmos, time, the world, the elements, gravity. So aging is a divine, ingenious, supernatural process. See, to heaven and angels, wrinkles are something to bow before. To heaven and, and angels, age and wisdom is true magnificence, true superiority. Man understands that. In the secular world, they say power is knowledge. Knowledge is power. So true loveliness are actually age spots and wrinkles. Now, moms are nurturers, so they support and they actually propagate. And they then when, they, when, when life comes forth, they nurture that life. So we call the earth Mother Earth. But we have a, time, we have a term for father, don't we? So that idiom, that expression of time, we never really stop to think about the world we live in. But if we were to think about the world we live in, we'd say, oh, I live among trees, among people. I live in a civilized society of laws. But it's, it's actually bigger than that. It's more, it's more that we need to get closer and closer to the truth and essence of that. It's actually we live in time. And in time, in the bubble of time, are all these other things. We actually live in this creation called time. So, Father Time, and God is the Father of Time. Like I said, we have all kinds of measurements. Every day we're utilizing measurements, whether it's kilometers, or miles, or a time card, or even the heart that's beating in your chest. It's a measurement. The watch that's on your arm or the smartphone phone that's in your purse. We live, by, we live by units, by measurements. Because time is a means of measuring. So did you know why they called Time Magazine Time Magazine? What a, why call a magazine Time? What a weird name for a magazine. U.S. News and World Report. Okay, I get that. National Geographic, I get that. But the best, the best way to truly express what a, what, a, what a reporter does is time. Everybody's doing time. So Time Magazine, mag magazine named their magazine Time because time is an account keeper of events, 
and a measure of duration between those events. That's what the definition of time is. So I'm going to read you the full definition of time. Time is an observed phenomenon by means of which human beings sense and record changes in the environment and in the universe, whether it's political, whether it's cosmetic, whether it's topographical, whether it's geographical, time records the changes in the universe. A literal definition for time has been, this is what science says, the literal definition of time is elusive. They don't have one. They can't figure it out. Isn't that amazing? Man will say all that they want to say about eternity. Minimize it, ridicule it, poo-poo it, but they still consider time elusive. I think that they ought to figure out what time's all about before they even begin to say a word about eternity. So the literal definition for time is, science says, they confess is elusive. Time has been called even an illusion. Many people that suffer forms of de depression or are bipol bipolar do not feel they're in real time. They do not feel they're in the dimension of time. Time is smooth, flowing continuum. Time is a smooth, flowing, moving continuum. You say, I'm going to take a nap today because Brother Jeff preached too long. I'm tired. I had a big meal. So I'm going to take a Sunday nap. Well, that, you say, well, well I'm, 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 where, what did you do on Sunday? Well, after I went to church, I took a nap. So you did nothing. Oh, yeah, I kind of just laid around. It was nice. No, actually, in that hour's nap, your, you, you traveled, your, your blood traveled 500 miles. String out your arteries. And in that hour that you were on the couch, your blood was moving 500 miles. 12,000 miles after the day is done. Oh, why you took that nap, by the way, you moved, you moved, uh, you moved 9,000 miles through space. See, here's the Earth, here's the Sun, and it's 93 million miles away. And the Earth is turning like this. It takes 24 hours to make a total revolution for that Earth. And while it's turning, it's going around the Sun. So as it orbits around the sun, it's traveling miles and miles and miles. So while you took that one hour nap, you traveled. You went on a journey. You went on a journey for 9,000 miles. You weren't standing still at all. Time is a current. Time is a current. If we could better understand time, we would use it properly. Time is such a gift. Albert Einstein said, the only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. <laughs> and that's the truth. That Because he understood that time was merely a measurement. Time is a measurement. So, the only reason for time is that so that everything doesn't happen at once. I didn't finish my definition of time. Time has been called an illusion of dimension, a smooth flowing current, an expression of separation among events that occur in the same physical location. The world is a physical location. But time is the measurement of all those events that take place in that physical location. So Einstein's Einstein's quip is filled with genius, wisdom. The only reason for time is so that everything doesn't happen at once. How many remember Y2K? Okay, so Maddie, when were you born? 1999. Okay, you were born when Y2K took place. Let me explain Y2K. Y, year, 2, 2, K, 1,000. Year 2,000. Y is a year, 2 is 2, and K is 1,000. So we have 2K, so we have year 2,000. And they used it that way because 
that was the digital way in which the programmers had created the computers in, in the, at the Pentagon, in Washington, the mainframes that ran all of the businesses, your personal computer, the satellites. What they did was, is because digitization and memorization was so scarce during that time, it was pricey. So rather than the computers write uh, two or one nine nine nine, they would just go nine nine. Or two thousand and four, they just put zero four. Just to space, just to save a little bit of space because memorization was so expensive back then. Floppy disks. You know, we thought, you know, uh, a, a megabyte was a lot. You know, now we have, what do we have? Terabytes. Terabytes. I was going to say a trilobyte. <laughs> That's going backwards. <clears throat> Terabytes. So now, the world of digi digitized time, they thought the world of virtual, virtual means it's not real, but it's so close to real it seems virtual. The world of virtual time that man created, they thought because they omitted the zero, zero, or the first two digits in front of 1977 or whatever, they thought that all the computers were going to stop or break down. So they called it Y2K. They, they felt it was going to be a, a, a techno technological apocalypse. I mean, we, we couldn't defend. Satellites would fall out of the sky or go off into some other trajectory. They didn't know what was going to happen with Y2K. Well, luckily enough, there was enough scientists and technologists and people who were brilliant, and they, they, they went about creating different things in which to in which to put into the computer and then stop that process. Many uh, computers did mess up. A lot of things did happen. A lot of the phones in China that had been created, in Japan had been created, um, would, would actually um, delete. If you wrote down a date for a particular meeting, it would delete it, automatically taking it back to another date because they figured you were wrong. So they deleted it. It just became non-existent. But other than that, there was not a whole lot of hiccups. But it was man messing with measurement. Man messing with virtual time. So pretty time is so powerful that if you mess with it in a virtual world, it can mess up your real world. How many kids live in a virtual world of games? And you know what it does? Messes up the real world really messes up the real world because they live in non-reality. How many people have, uh, you know, when I think about the legalization of pot, I mean, I still have friends today that are old friends that smoke a lot of pot and they still say, hey, man. <laughs> wow, man. That was one of my favorite words. Awesome. They, they, they smoke too much pot and they're going to legalize it? They're going to legalize it? Talk about the dumbing down of a nation. They're going to legalize pot? Oh, my goodness. They're going to make it recreational? That's scary. Medicinal? No problem. Recreational? Ooh, not a good thing. I have a lot of people who won't be able to live in the current of time. The current of time will sweep them away. The current of time, they'll, they'll crash along the shore of the great river of time. They won't make it. You have, to be, you have to be very responsible to handle time. Very responsible. Otherwise, time doesn't stop for anybody. It keeps going. And if you don't know how to utilize time, because you can't save it and you can't put it in a bottle. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to stop, but I can carry on next Sunday. Hallelujah. Oh. This Sunday, this uh, Wednesday is the 17th, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So that's at our house. Don't forget and invite any friends you'd like. We're going to have a Bible study on how to study the Bible. A Bible study on how to study the Bible. To be able to look at the Bible with, with a, a, you look at a reference, then you have to have a context around that reference. So if you read a scripture uh, um, that's in the scriptures in the Bible, and it's one verse, then in order for you to understand that one verse, you have to look at the context. So a, a verse without a context is a pretext. So you have to have a context. Otherwise, 
anybody can say anything they want to say about a verse. It cannot be isolated. You have to have, you have, to have proof texting going on. So you've got to take a concept and then proof text it from Genesis to Revelations. Because the one thing about the Bible is, is that the author spanned the writing of the Bible through thousands of years but it's, for him, it's thematically perfect. What man does to, make a, to get a diphthong in the way or a comma or to uh, maybe tell the story differently in, Jane, uh, in um, Matthew than it is said in John is, is, a, no, is a total non-issue. That's just the human element. But the theme is perfect. It's perfect. So the author put that through the entire Bible for us to then take concepts in Daniel and bring them forward in Revelations, concepts in Genesis and bring them forward to the Gospels. So it has to match. And so some of the things that we didn't do properly in our former rearing was as we isolated too many scriptures. Isolated too many scriptures. And to be honest, we were very ignorant about our Bible. We knew a lot about supposed mysteries, but we really didn't know our Bible like we should. And that's what we want to bring out Wednesday is we want to talk about how to take a concept in the Bible and then take it all the way through Scripture. It's going to be a very interesting study. Now, I want to close with this. Now, man in all of his genius can change so many things, manipulate so many things, but he can't change time. He can tell time. So can a five-year-old. But he can't change time. So, Time, one, is a measurement, but the question I want to leave you with is, is that I want you to con contemplate is, is, what does time do? What does time do? Now, the best short answer is, time changes things. That's what time does. You say, no, time doesn't change actually anything. Uh, Rain and wind and gravity and fire change things within time. Time doesn't change anything. Time, time is a space, and within the space is wind and gravity and water and fire, and they do all the changing. Time isn't really changing anything, but that's not true. Because if you step into eternity while living on Earth, the Grand Canyon still erodes, the rain still falls, in eternity, those things will be carrying on. There'll still be rain, there'll still be wind, there'll still be fire, there'll still be rivers carving their way through the terra firma. So, so it is not just fire or rain or wind transforming the topography. So, so what is greater than fire, wind, gravity, is this thing that we call time. time. Time is the ruler of all of that. Time rules it all. Nothing but God rules time. Time is the ruler. So <clears throat> time is much greater than really what science calls a measurement. Time is an unstoppable current. Man can stop the currents of the mightiest. Think of the Ganges. Think of the Mississippi. Think of the Zambezi. But they put dams. Think of the Euphrates and what ISIS is doing right now with the Euphrates River. They're drying up the river for tactical reasons to get across. Which, by the way, the scripture says that one day the river Euphrates would be dried up to make a way for the kings of the east. This will be the first time that the Euphrates has ever been dried up. Does it have a scriptural implication? Could very well have. Could very well have. But the Euphrates River that's been there since Adam and Eve, and we can stop its current. Man is pretty powerful, but he can't stop the current of time. In fact, men will think about giving, prolonging your life, giving you a stint, uh, helping you with diabetes, putting you on a better diet, let you live from 70 to 90 and do quite well. You can still maybe even ride your bike or 
whatever. And man knows that they can, they can help man live longer and even live, a, a, a quality-wise, a greater life. But the interesting thing is, is man doesn't even actually contemplate or consider stopping time. Because it's, it's so big, they don't even, science doesn't even go there. Put a lunar module on Mars? Sure. But let's manipulate time. No, it is so big, they don't even touch it. So then, if God is the father of time, then the question we want to answer Sunday is, is why are we in time?